Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? Computers have come in a wide variety of form factors, shapes, and sizes. Desktops, laptops, tablets, even smartphones, and now watches and other wearable gear. So what happened to netbooks? All right, so this episode was prompted by a suggestion from a viewer, and it's actually kind of an interesting case because it's not just the typical scenario of one particular piece of technology becoming popular and dying out as if it was a fad. This is about an entire form factor coming and going, and it's really kind of a, a combination of different factors that all came together at one period of time that led the market to believe a certain thing was going to become this large industry-wide push, and it ended up being more of just a quick trend than anything else. And of course, we're talking about netbooks. Well, netbooks, let's get a little bit of a definition going as to what I mean when I'm talking netbooks. I mean these small little laptops Typically anywhere between like a six and 10 inch size screen. Um, usually the keyboard is kind of shrunk down from the normal size, not quite as easy to type on. They're meant to be really small and really light and really portable. They've actually come out quite a while ago. It, you know, it's easy to think of some of this technology as being more recent than it really is, but the beginning of the netbook era was really kind of towards the late 2000s. Sometime around the end of 2006, early 2008 was really when that big push happened. Which, kind of scary to think, it's already 2017 as I'm filming this. Netbooks were popular 10 years ago. And a lot has changed in the 10 years since. So here's the story behind netbooks as I best understand it. Now, to give you a little bit of background on how I know some of this information, I've been working in computers and IT professionally my entire life. Um, I'm coming up on pretty soon here, another scary thing to think about, 20 years of experience working with computers as my primary source of income. Um, that's not too far away for me. So I've seen a lot of the progression of computing technology and the trends and where things have come and gone and that sort of thing. So I was right in the thick of it in 2007 when netbooks came and ultimately went. Why netbooks became popular or why the industry thought netbooks would become popular was a combination of different things, as I said. The biggest one, though, was internet connectivity. You see, up until, say, the mid-2000s, when people got online, at least at home, it was this very concerted effort that they had to take on their part, right? It was typically through dial-up, and because it's dial-up, that means you're dealing with a wired phone connection, a cable coming out of the wall and going into your computer. So the vast majority of people who would be getting online at home, not for business use, would be doing so on a desktop. I'm sure some of them did use their laptops that way. The other factor, and we'll get to that in a little bit, is what the nature of laptops were like themselves at the time. But anyway, getting on the internet in the 90s up until the mid 2000s was typically like it involved a lot of effort right you had to actually dial in and it's like i'm going to get online and i'm going to spend some time online and then i'm going to done you know be done being online and so it wasn't such a quick casual i'm going to just spend 30 seconds to check my email kind of a thing check twitter check whatever like we have today where our interactions are very quick back then it was i'm going to dial into AOL or my ISP, whatever, and I'm going to surf the web for a while. So there was a lot of effort involved in it. Obviously, if it was a phone line, you'd be tying up the phone or you'd have a second phone line. There was an additional cost to doing all of that. The internet for consumers was actually relatively inconvenient. It was super cool and amazing, but it was inconvenient. Starting around the mid-2000s, though, was when we started to see 
broadband and other high speed internet access really start making its way into people's homes, into the ordinary people's homes, not just kind of the technologically minded people who knew to ask for it and were willing to pay the pretty expensive price at times to get it. So things like cable and DSL and other types of high speed connections were starting to become available in regular neighborhoods and the pricing was fairly competitive. But the big thing that those brought was one, always on internet connectivity. And two, along that time as well, we started to see options like wireless internet, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has been one of the biggest game changers in terms of networking and even just the internet in general ever, right? I think only the ethernet spec itself has probably been the bigger impact on networking other than Wi-Fi. So you've got this, you know, this newfound freedom in a way for people where they can get online all the time and they can spend as much or as little time as they want on it. It doesn't take any more or less effort to do a quick check of your email as it does to sit and you know screw around on the web for hours on end. Plus, now that you have wireless capability, you can do so anywhere in the house and multiple people can share it at the same time. So that became a major push where I feel manufacturers were kind of looking at it going, boy, you know, if people want to just get online really quick and easy, you know, they shouldn't need this big desktop computer in order to do so. They could use a smaller, less expensive, more convenient device. The other part is laptops themselves. Now, laptop prices had been coming down through the 2000s. Laptops were traditionally, at least in the 90s, very expensive. You would spend thousands of dollars on a laptop that wasn't even really all that high end compared to what desktops had to offer. And even in the 2000s, while performance on laptops was getting better and prices were coming down, there was still a premium. You were still going to pay close to a thousand bucks for a mid-range laptop. So the combination of internet kind of everywhere, or at least much more convenient, plus a demand for more people to want to get online but not spend a ton of money to do so, led to the birth of the netbook. The concept is, like I said, a small, easy to use, inexpensive or less expensive device that can be used primarily for screwing around on the internet, basically. So, the technology kind of evolved around a form factor like that. And another big thing that contributed to helping the netbook was Intel had around that time released its Atom series of processors. It's a lower power in terms of, you know, electricity consumption chip, but it was also lower power in terms of performance. But that suited itself really well for the application that these manufacturers had in mind. They wanted something small and convenient and you can easily throw in a bag and carry around with you because laptops at that era really weren't all that small, weren't all that convenient. They were still pretty heavy and you needed a dedicated carrying bag for a full-size laptop. So netbooks came out and they were admittedly very low power, but they were also fairly inexpensive, really only a few hundred bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks, somewhere in there got you into a netbook. Performance, of course, was going to be fairly low. As I mentioned, the CPUs were fairly slow. The screens were pretty small. Typically, like I said, somewhere between like six and 10 inches, you know, were the various options. Uh, RAM, of course, you have to keep RAM specs in mind compared to today. But, you know, it was common to see 256 to 512 megs of RAM in a netbook and that was enough but not necessarily you know anything that would set the world on fire in terms of performance and then storage was low as well um, we were starting to see some options with flash storage back then of course it was a small capacity anywhere between like 8 and 32 gigabytes uh, some netbooks offered hard drives but they were still fairly small hard drives maybe 80 you know, 80 gigabytes, that sort of thing. So eight to 32 gig flash, 80 gig at the most for hard drive. Um, like I said, they were small. So the, the touch, you know, the, the touchpad was small, the keyboard was small. They were meant to be kind of cute, I guess, in a way. 
they were meant to appeal to a broader audience than just the real tech heads who would go out and buy a big powerful laptop and spend a ton of money on it, right? There was, I think, a noble purpose to netbooks in that they were maybe trying to kind of democratize the internet, try to get more people who otherwise weren't that interested in computers to be involved in getting on the internet and getting more involved in the internet than they were before. Because I guess if regular, regular people were on the internet on their desktop, they were probably using a service like AOL, where it was like kind of a closed off type of system, a little bit of a walled garden. And by the time netbooks were new, the internet had kind of been busted wide open. We'd gone through the dot-com boom. Um, AOL really wasn't as big of a thing anymore. You were generally just surfing the web directly, going to actual websites instead of going through all this content curated kind of stuff. So netbooks, you know, they released them. There were a whole ton of different manufacturers, different models. Probably the biggest one, um, at least in terms of name, was Asus and their EPC models. They had several of those. Uh, some of them were actually pretty decent. Other ones were absolute crap. And that's kind of telling about netbooks in general was there was a lot of variability there. Some manufacturers offered some really decent ones. Of course, they were more expensive and other ones offered less expensive ones and they were very slow. And I, I think those were part of the reason why netbooks didn't really stick around, which is, I guess, the, the next progression on this topic is where did netbooks go? Well, the first thing is I don't think all that many people actually bought netbooks. Um, I, you know, like I said, I was working in the computer industry. I, I had a pretty good sense of what sales were for various products. I saw tons of netbooks for sale, but I never really saw a ton of people using them in real life like on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see occasionally somebody in a library with one or something like that, but they certainly didn't feel to me like the big boom that the manufacturers wanted them to be. It really felt more like a manufactured trend, you know, where, where companies try to convince people that this new product they're putting out is going to be a trendy thing and they should buy it instead of letting the actual people who buy them decide what's going to be a trend or not. You know, that's, that's the way I define trends is... The only thing that's truly a trend is when people legitimately want to go buy it of their own accord because they think it's cool and not because some company tells them you should buy this. This is going to be cool. This is going to be a trend. You know, that's just astroturfing or, you know, or, or fake, fake trending, I guess you could say. There's a whole nother podcast in that topic probably, but it, it felt like netbooks were really kind of forced on the people and instead of the manufacturers taking the knowledge of building these netbooks, you know, taking that knowledge of how do you engineer a smaller, lighter laptop and applying it towards machines that were a little bit more mainstream oriented, right? The thing with netbooks is they could run most programs. They came most commonly with Windows XP. Some of them actually came with Linux on them, which... I think in some ways is the closest we have ever been and perhaps will ever come to having a full Linux installation used in a desktop type environment, you know, where you've got keyboard and pointer and mouse and you're actually running traditional applications, not on a touchscreen type device. You know, they were real computers in a way, but they were so crippled in so many aspects. Both the form factor was just too small to comfortably type on for long periods. The touchpads were tiny. You know, moving the cursor around the screen was really annoying. The screen itself was tiny and very low resolution, and the performance was not very good. The battery life was okay in some ways, but as manufacturers tried to push that whole thin and light and small form factor, the battery sizes got cut down, so battery life kind of suffered. They really ended up just being cheap computers. And that's what I think turned a lot of people off to netbooks to the point where, you know, I look at a computer from say 2008, a, like a, a full size laptop from 2008, 
And I look at that and go, you know, that was kind of cool. And I get a little bit of a sense of nostalgia to it, you know, uh, remembering what my own laptop was like back then. And, you know, look at all the cool features this thing had for its time, you know, that sort of thing. But then I look at a netbook, I'll occasionally come across like a netbook at my day job, typically on the recycle pile. And I'll look at it and go, God, this thing, whoever wanted one of these, who, uh, whoever wanted one of these. And the other part of it was my own experience with netbooks. So I bought a netbook probably around, oh, I'd like to say it was l middle to late 2009, maybe it was when netbook hardware had started to stabilize, but I don't think sales, I think sales were kind of flat. Um, I bought a Dell Inspiron Mini was their branding for netbooks. And I bought it because of course I'm curious about technology. It wasn't very expensive. I think it was a refurbished unit that I bought from Dell's site for like 200 bucks. It wasn't a ton of money. Um, it came with Windows XP or Vista. I don't quite remember. I think it was XP. Um, one of the other reasons why I wanted to kind of goof around with it as a quick side note was at the time, hacking Mac OS X to work on PC hardware had started to become really popular. Since Apple switched Macs from PowerPC to Intel processors in 2005, people had started to figure out how to get the operating system working on non-Apple branded hardware. And that particular laptop, I think it was the Inspiron Mini 9, it was a nine inch screen. That was, I guess, one of the better ones to try and get that working on. I did get it working on there. I do remember actually getting OS X to load on this machine, but even OS X, which I feel is an OS that works exceptionally well on laptops, it, even it couldn't save the horrible experience that was a netbook. You know, on that computer, small screen, small keyboard, low performance, the Atom chip just wasn't very fast. The storage was never very fast. It was cute and it was small and it was easy to carry around, but if you didn't want to use it, you didn't want to use it. And so ultimately, you know, after kind of noodling around with my own netbook for a couple of months, I ended up wiping it and selling it on for just a little bit less than what I originally paid. So at least I didn't take too much of a bath in it, but you know, I, it, it, I think that was a common experience for a lot of people where they'd buy one of these thinking, oh, this would be really cool. And then they actually used it and it never really clicked with them. They realized this wasn't that great of an experience. So netbooks kind of faded out, at least in terms of that form factor. But what's interesting is they did leave a bit of a legacy. And some of that legacy is still seen today. Of course, tablets largely took over where netbooks left off. Tablets were, I think, perhaps what netbooks should have been, where it is a thin and light and easy to use interface that's perfectly suited for just getting on the internet and browsing content. The way most tablets do it with a touchscreen is just much more intuitive and easy to use than a cramped keyboard and a tiny touchpad. But even in the mid 2010s, I'd like to say sometime around 2004, um, if I'm getting my dates correct, netbooks started to kind of take a bit of a comeback. And that was when Windows 8 started to become popular. Um, I went to the Microsoft store at the Mall of America here in Minneapolis. Uh, it was the only time I ever bought anything from the Microsoft store. And I'll, maybe that's another good podcast topic as well to talk about Apple versus Microsoft's retail strategies. But I bought an HP Stream 11 from the Microsoft store sometime in the mid 2010s because I kind of got caught in that whole, you know, I'd like to have a small, thin, light laptop to carry around that's good for surfing the web. That particular model, and there were several other models from other manufacturers that went for this whole, you know, the, this particular market segment was a true thin and light. It was pretty thin, it was pretty light. It was an 11 inch screen, which is bigger and definitely more usable. The keyboard wasn't as cramped, the touchpad was bigger, and it had an Intel Celeron dual core CPU in it. Like I said, running Windows 8, so it was a full OS again, I could run whatever program I wanted on there, but it was still a crippled machine ultimately. 
Only two gig of RAM in that computer. Only 32 gig of eMMC flash for storage. And if any of you are familiar with computing, eMMC is probably the slowest type of flash storage you can get. It's not fast. It's about the same speed as like an SD card because that's kind of basically what it is. It, that Stream 11, just it, it was a really nice computer. And again, I only paid like 180 bucks for it. It was cheap, but I just couldn't get into it. So even on this second phase of netbooks where the industry had really kind of gotten itself together and it had experience building thin and light laptops and was simply trying to drive the price down to a point where people could impulse buy them, which I basically did, even then it still just didn't work. And so that's why I think we haven't seen quite as many of those low end thin and lights anymore. That trend to me came and went again, and it still didn't work. So now what we're seeing is prices on computers actually kind of going back up. The industry realizing if people are gonna buy a true computer with a full-fledged you know, productivity-based operating system, not a tablet, not a smartphone, let's give them a real computer that actually performs. So the average selling price of computers has been going up, not down, which is interesting. So netbooks have had a bit of a legacy in that not only did they kind of try again with that same form factor, but they splintered out into true thin and light computers that were expensive and powerful, but had that you know convenient form factor. But then also this completely different form factor in terms of tablets that kept that whole premise of really easy, convenient access to the internet, just not necessarily using the same interface that people were used to. So with that, I am of course curious as to your thoughts. Did you own a netbook? Do you still own a netbook? Do you still use a netbook? I hope you're not if you're using an old one like that. Did you buy one of these newer types of netbooks from the mid 2010s with like the Celeron and the low RAM and, and the low flash? Do those work for your needs? I'm just curious as to your thoughts. So be sure to share them down in the comments below. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.